All right, one of the Young Turks. I am, in fact, your host, Cenk Uger. Um, I believe we've got a lot of news ahead. Uh, now, we've throughout the week, everybody's talked about uh, the little fella enough. Uh, God bless everybody's hearts. Yes, I had a son. His name is Prometheus Maximus Uger. Let's get beyond it. God bless. Go forward. Uh, now, uh, also, there's been a, a number of great things happening with MSNBC. Uh, let me just quickly tell you about that. Uh, from now on, every Friday at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern, I will be going on as a guest uh, on MSNBC. Uh, that's a regular segment we're going to do. That's fantastic. And uh, the more people watch, the more we'll uh, be able to get our message out. And that's a very good thing. The more we're on, uh, the more we get to tell people what the truth is. So, or at least our version of it and give it a shot. So if you guys uh, can tune in uh, on Fridays on MSNBC at 3 o'clock, that would be fantastic. All right, so now it's been a whole week. I got a lot of news to get to. Let's get to it, right? So uh, it's something fairly substantial happened this week. Uh, financial reform passed the Senate. It'll go to Obama's desk. He'll sign it. it. Passed 60 to 38. Should we celebrate? Well, of course, Obama administration says that this is the greatest financial reform ever done since the Great Depression. It's awesome. Mission accomplished. Everybody hang the banner. So, okay, you know how it goes. Okay, right? So, uh, now, of course, the press has repeated that in every single article, every single news story about how it's the most important and, and overwhelming financial reform we've had since the Great Depression. Okay, so how overwhelming was it? Well, did we really get uh, derivatives regulation uh, where they do the risky trading, etc.? Well, if, just to give you some sense of it, the CEO of Citigroup, uh, Vikram Pandit, said today, yeah, it won't really touch our derivatives trading at all. Okay, and they did a carve out of three percent, which then turns out it's three percent of their assets, but it's actually forty percent of their trading. Then you've got these giant loopholes uh, about how it's going to, you know, take so, first of all several years to implement. But then even when they do that, they they feel like you know what they'd like to hedge their uh, assets by doing derivatives. They still can't. So you know all about the loopholes, and that's how it passed, right? Now, but there is an upside. The upside is, hey, you know what? Uh, Regulators can really get tough on them if they're, they think there's systemic risk, and they can even limit their derivatives trading. Gary Gensler can do that uh, at the Commodity Futures uh, Trading Commission. Fantastic. Uh, you've got a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Good, great. So actually something positive can come out of this. But the next question, and everyone agrees, Paul Volcker, who uh, pushed for the Volcker rule initially, even Chris Dodd, who says, look, you know what? We'll see how the regulators have to do this. He says, look, it's not Congress's job to regulate. I would disagree with him. So we just kind of left it up to the regulators. Everyone agrees it's up to the regulators. So, but that's good. That's, there's hope, right? Because if you get the right regulators, maybe they actually take care of the problems, right? Well, that's why I want to lay out a marker for you guys. Should we celebrate this? Should we not? It depends. Right now, uh, who's going to hand, hey, be the head of that Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right? Well, uh, Elizabeth Warren was the logical choice. She's the one who championed it. It was her idea in the first place, et cetera. Everybody assumed that she was going to be the head of it until, of course, uh, well, maybe not. Not so much. We, we're thinking about it. Huffington Post had an article saying that Tim Geithner is uh, against this. Really? I didn't see that coming at all. Now, Tim Geithner is against it because she actually wants to protect consumers from banks, and his, his job, according to him, is to protect the financial integrity of our institutions, meaning protect the big banks, right? Plus, she's been all over his ass. She kept asking him question after question about, hey, wait a minute, why did you give AIG 100% uh, of the, or why did you give Goldman Sachs and other banks 100% of the money that AIG owed them with taxpayer money? That doesn't make any sense. And he didn't like those tough questions, right? Now, other people have said, oh, no, Huffington Post, they don't know what they're talking about. That story can't be right. Obama's awesome, of course he's going to appoint Elizabeth Warren. Well, so then the next set of stories come out. David Axelrod comes out and says, oh, no, 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 Elizabeth Warren is fantastic. There are also other people who are really good. <laughs> I thought, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> hey, he said, oh, yeah, you know, and here's where I thought, oh, elbow from the sky, we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> okay, he said, Oh, no matter what position she goes to, she'll uh, have a very important role in how we do financial reform. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> there she goes, right onto the bus. Okay, so now, look, I'm not saying it's a done deal, and she was such an overwhelming favorite, she might still survive this, right? But obviously some people inside the Obama White House have their knives out for her, because she actually would protect you guys. So, I mean, look, I call that Obama's last test, and people say, oh, what do you mean last test? Look, because here's the thing. Here's why this is the last test, as to whether he will keep Gary Gensler and he'll actually t do tough regulatory reform, whether he'll actually appoint Elizabeth Warren and they'll do regulatory reform. The reason it's the last test is because I've been told by the pro-Obama people that the, the guys that wear the D on their helmets and Democrats, yeah, rah, 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 those guys, Team Democrat told me, no, Cenk, you don't understand. Obama is brilliant. His brilliance cannot, you know, it eludes your t small, tiny mind, right? And what he's going to do is he's going to pass something that looks kind of weak, but in fact allows the regulators to come in and do what's really re needed. Okay, I'm game. I'm game. I, and here it is. So is he going to do that? If he does, I swear to God I'll come back out here and go, you know what? Tiny mind. Couldn't handle it. Obama's a strategist. He moved the things around. And it turns out, yeah, we got, you know, we reined in the big banks. They're not too big to fail anymore. They're not doing risky derivatives trading with our money, whether it's taxpayer money or depositors' money. You know me. I swear to God, that's a, I would love that. You want to talk about, oh, I just played for half an hour straight, right? So that, but that's why we got a shot. But is he going to do it? I don't know. And my guess is the initial leanings are not good. Those stories about how Elizabeth Warren might be good in another role, or she's been great, but there are other people that are even better. Those are bad, bad signs. And even if Gary Gensler do, does want to do some sort of reform and actually do regulation, and, that, and I'm laying that guy's name out there, because if you see Gary Gensler go under the bus, forget about it. They were joking all along. They were never, because Gary Gensler, his division is even more important, because they're the ones that are stopping the fraud, the derivatives trading, if it's uh, too risky, etc. That's more macro picture. That's what's going to get things under control if you allow him to do his job, okay? But if you see him go under the bus and you see Warren go under the bus, then there is no grand plan. They're not going to come back around and do the right thing. They're, they, they're playing you. They're going to pretend to be progressives during the, uh, the campaigns as they're doing now and as they did in 2008. And the minute it's time to make a deal, they're going to make a deal with the business interests and make sure they're protected. Now, here's another bad sign. Obama uh, officials, including Valerie Jarrett and Rahm Emanuel, of course, two of the likely candidates, reaching out to the business roundtable, asking them, what would you like to deregulate? Are you kidding me? What would you like to deregulate? And surprisingly, they had uh, dozens of suggestions. So, so now, see, quietly, we're uh, beginning the negotiations over what to deregulate when we just started regulation in the first place. The signs are not good. There's still possibility. And no one in America would be happier if Obama proved me wrong on my skepticism and my cynicism. Okay? But I'm trying to look out for you. I'm trying to tell you what's really happening behind the scenes. Right now, it doesn't look that great. Okay. So now, you got... Uh, Geithner going after uh, Warren. Oh, by the way, here, let me give you some quick quotes from Paul Volcker. Uh, he's the guy, remember, who, well, the Volcker rule, and the Obama administration is totally in favor of it, and that's going to stop too big to fail, right? Uh, here are some quotes from him in a New York Times story. People are nervous about the long-term outlook, and they should be. Uh, the success of this approach is going to be heavily dependent on how aggressively and intelligently it is implemented, right? So he's pushing for tougher implementation, First signs are weaker implementation. Uh, he continues um, about the Volcker rule. He said the problem was the Obama administration, and this is his quote, initially disagreed. They didn't want to do the Volcker rule. They didn't want to split the bank's proprietary trading, their own trading, from uh, the depositor's money. They wanted to use the depositor's money for the riskiest trading. And then uh, finally, uh, when asked about hey, how do you feel about this bill? Volcker said, obviously, it does not go as far as I felt it should go. These are not good signs. Now, look, let me go to one of Radigan's points that he uh, goes ballistic over, right? And rightfully so, in my opinion. 
look, why do we have 10% unemployment? Why are 8 million people out of jobs? Why hasn't the stimulus worked as well as we want it to? I mean, it's, I'm, not, I'm not dogging the stimulus. The stimulus was the right thing to do, right? Uh, but why haven't we re recovered a little bit better than we had hoped at this point? It's partly because it was such a deep recession, partly because it was going to be hard to recover in the first place. All those things are true, and I'm not putting any of that on Obama. It was Bush who started that, right? No question, and that was the collapse, right? But could we have gotten to a little bit better situation? I think we could have. How? Well, why are we not creating the jobs? It's because the banks are sucking all the money out of the system. That's why Matt Taibbi called Goldman Sachs, for example, the great vampire squid. Because they're sucking the depositors' money, they're sucking them bailout money, direct and indirect, and they're using it for the riskiest of bets. Why? Because the riskiest of bets gets them the highest amount of profit in the short term. That's why they're back to making record profits. But what, so that's, that's terrible because that's going to crash. But the second part that Radigan talks about all the time that's so important is, look, that money should not be going to those bets. That money should be going into the economy. It should be going into lending to big businesses and small businesses, to any businesses, to Americans. But it's not going into the real economy. And so the, a lot of the companies, whether they're small or big, don't have money to hire people. Why? Because the vampire squids are sucking up all the money and doing Vegas-style trading with it. And right now, our best hope is that regulators within the next 18 months to two years begin to understand that concept and fight against it. But the initial signs are not good. And so when Obama go, is wondering, like, I don't know, man, God, gee, well, because why are we at 10% unemployment? Because you sucked all the money out of the system and gave it to the bankers. Because Tim Geithner is dead wrong and has always been wrong. Larry Summers is dead wrong and was the guy who was initially wrong to deregulate in the first place. So, you know, we get on Obama's advisors all the time, Geithner, Summers, you know, Valerie Jarrett, Rahm Emanuel, whoever it might be, right? But that's why I called it Obama's last test, and I wrote about this, and you can see it on the youngturks.com. Look, this is your time. Now you get to pick the right advisors, okay? You get to pick the good advisors instead of the bad advisors. If you keep picking the bad advisors and you keep making bad decisions, well, then you're a bad president. Now, that sounds heavy, doesn't it? But what am I going to do? I, look, if they throw Elizabeth Warren under the bus, it's not because she's a demigod and there's no one else who can do regulation or anything like that. It's just a sign. It's a sign that the bankers won again, that they were not going to do real reform. They're not going to really protect consumers. No, the bankers are always going to win. On the other hand, we can come back on Monday and say, hey, look, she was the predominant favorite, and she got, you know, and Obama made the right decision. That would be great, and I would celebrate it. And it is possible. All right, so we'll see how that goes. Meanwhile, I told you they're meeting with the uh, <laughs> business roundtable. Uh, meanwhile, oh, the SEC settled a suit, um, uh, the Goldman Sachs suit. So Goldman Sachs uh, was part of defrauding, quite literally, uh, the investors by turning around and uh, letting the guy who was betting against the, the assets pick the worst possible assets. And then they turn around and go, oh, no, don't worry about that guy. Yeah, sure, all oh, these are great assets. What are you talking about? Come and buy, come and buy. So the government charged them with fraud, civil fraud, and today they settled that case. It is interesting timing. <laughs> you know, they uh, announced the case when they were talking about doing tough derivatives reform and let's go get the bankers and look at us going after the bankers. Now that reform has passed, they're like, oh, yeah, let's wrap that Goldman Sachs thing up, right? So now, a big heavy fine, $550 million. Good, okay? Is it enough? <laughs> Look, to give you a sense of whether it's enough or not, it is a little over 3% of their 2009 bonus pool. Okay, 3.4%. Ba ding! <laughs> okay, so they wrapped that thing up. Oh, by the way, Goldman Sachs stock rises tremendously after this news. Okay, good, the government is off of Goldman Sachs' back, right? And look, he, here's a, and I talked about this today on the Radigan appearance. Here's how you'll know if the SEC is for real and is, for, is serious. If they go after Goldman Sachs for the toxic assets they put together. Remember, in this case, they let this guy, hedge fund guy, John Polson, put it together. He made most of the money. But in a great majority of the cases, they put together the assets and they made the money while everything crashed, right? 
they go after them for that, that's the real deal, then we'll know, hey, you know what, Obama, master strategist, is actually going to let his regulators do the work, and they're going to go after the bad guys. Great. If they don't, shwang, wang, wang. All right. Uh, and now I mentioned um, Radigan appearance a couple of times. I was on MSNBC a couple of times today. Uh, you know, two hours today, not enough time, uh, but it is on our YouTube channel. For those of you who have been living in a box, God bless your heart, youtube.com slash the Young Turks. I only say that because your Young Turks viewers watching, so I presume you know. But nonetheless, uh, go and check out those clips if you're interested. Uh, and and they, they were very, very kind, and they did a little thing about, I, it doesn't feel, it feels kind of awkward saying it still because it's so new, about my son. <laughs> so it was very nice of them. We're going to put that up on YouTube as well. All right, so check out those segments. Now, uh, now the final two things is perfect, though, uh, on financial reform. <sighs> you see I've been wanting to get this out off my chest for the last week. Um, so uh, now that all of this is done, and Blanche Lincoln, who had put together the tough derivatives uh, reform in the first place, uh, can show her true colors again. So she has proposed a new... Um, bill on the estate tax, along with John Kyle, a Republican, so it is uh, bipartisan, right? So the old estate tax, um, before the Bush folks came in, was 55%, right? Uh, so if you pass away and you have uh, over, and you can have a personal exemption of three and a half million dollars, and that applies for the, for example, the wife and the husband. So if as a couple you're beyond seven million dollars, what is above seven million dollars not their initial $7 million. What is above $7 million would get taxed at 55%. Now, the Bush people knocked that down to 45% and then said, oh, by the way, randomly in the year 2010, because they wanted it to be permanent, so it's not, of course, random, uh, you will have no estate tax. So today there's no estate tax. In fact, a billionaire died this year, and his family walked away with all the money. And remember, he earned the money, not the family. Conrad Hilton earned the money, as an example, not Paris Hilton. Now, if it, Conrad Hilton had passed away this year, Paris Hilton would get all the money for free, even though she didn't do a, a day's work for it, right? So that was the Republican plan, and they, would, they hoped that, well, maybe it'll stick and they will stay at 0%. But in, in order to make it work budgetarily, it had to come back up to 55% um, in the next year. So here comes Kyle and, and Lincoln, and they want to regulate on this, and they say, okay, we got to compromise. We'd like to make the personal exemption $5 million, so for couples that would be $10 million. So the first $10 million not touched for the couple, okay? So after that, we'd like the new rate to be 35%. Now, wait a minute, how's that a compromise? <laughs> the Bush guys had it at 45%. You're going to make it lower than the Bush people. Well, for a year it was 0%, so, you know, we're compromising. That's not a compromise. That allows the descendants of rich people to continue being rich when not having earned any of the money. Remember, look, the Rockefellers gave away, it, it, their estate tax was 90%. You know what we did with that 90%? We built bridges and dams and we built the infrastructure of this country. We built the middle class of this country, right? And, and what happened to the Rockefellers who had to live on only 10%? They're still massively rich to this day and they gave away a lot to charity. It was plenty of money, right? So they're gonna, these guys are going to let billions of dollars walk away so that the richest people in America, who didn't even initially earn it, get to keep it all, okay? Or at least in this case, get to keep 65% of the money after the initial $10 million that's free. Now, by the way, why is Blanche Lincoln, a so-called Democrat, doing this? First of all, she's not, she's not a progressive in any way, shape, or form. She's a corporatist. She's always been a corporatist. But in this case, specifically, you know who lives in Arkansas, her home state? The Walton family, who owns Walmart. And the Walton family has been fighting for the, killing the estate tax or lowering the estate tax for decades. Why? Because they stand to make more money than anyone else in the country if the estate tax is lowered. They would save billions upon billions of dollars. Now, you think their contributions to Blanche Lincoln's political campaigns might have had something to do with her position? Hmm, gee, I wonder. Okay, so now here comes that world of pain. And if Obama accepts the so-called compromise and lowers the state tax to 
all the good folks at Daily Coast and otherwise, all the people who are still on Team Democrat. Really? 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 <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to ask you. How, do you, how, how can you explain it? Now, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. These are the good Democrats like Blanche Lincoln, who a lot of those Democrats and Obama fought for, proposing this. Let's see where it goes. Okay, I fear. I fear. Okay, and then finally, uh, CNBC's Larry Kudlow has a theory as to uh, why the stock market has been doing well over the last, um, you know, several days, although it didn't do well today. So that might hurt his theory a little bit. It's because, according to him, Tim Geithner, in an interview with Kudlow, uh, promised that he will keep taxes low on um, money made off the stock market. Okay, which he did. Geithner promised that. Okay. So now the top rate is near 40% in taxes if you're actually earning money. But if you're investing in the stock market and you're getting that money, they tax it at, like, <laughs> right now the comic would low 15%. Geithner promised, oh, we won't do it above 20%, cap it at 20%. So the guys who make money off of investing, God bless their hearts, there's no problem with that, as long as they pay taxes like everybody else. But under Geithner's bold proposal, they would pay far less taxes than me, you, almost anyone watching this show. And so Cudlow says, oh, great job. My rich friends will get even richer. This is fantastic. The stock market is happy. Yeah, it's a short-term blip. The stuff people on, that are doing the investing in, in the go, okay, good. I'm going to get to keep more of my money. Fantastic. That might give you a little blip, but that's not the real economy. That's the stock market economy. That's the Wall Street economy. That doesn't get funneled over to the real economy. And I've, we've talked about that many times in the past. <sighs> They're not looking out for you, man. They're not looking out for you. I mean, Geithner, you're going to cap it at 20% for dividends, uh, it, et cetera. All right, man. I hate to bring you back to frustration. Now, having said this, as I always tell you, I mean, you want to talk about a rock and a hard place. Let's come back and let me tell you what the Republican proposals are and how they're criticizing this administration. Look at it, a world of criticism I just had for the administration. I hope very substantive, right? And when we come back, we're going to see the conservative criticism. Prepare to be amused, Young Turks. All right, uh, back on a Young Turks. So uh, before we get to the goofy stuff uh, from the uh, Republicans and conservatives, uh, let me get to some substantive disastrous points by uh, them. Uh, on financial reform, uh, they have a plan. Their plan is uh, we will immediately try to repeal it. Uh, John Boehner says, uh, I think, uh, quote, I think it ought to be repealed. Uh, GOP policy chairman John Thune from South Dakota says, well, uh, we can do something about it after the next election. Uh, so. He's saying, you know, wait till the next election, and then we hope to repeal it. George Lemieux from Florida says, I would try to repeal uh, the stuff that harms the economy. Uh, Wall Street's in favor of this bill. It's Main Street. That's going to get hurt. Okay. Look, if they made a substantive point against, hey, you know what, actually this is too light on Wall Street, then I say, okay, hey, you know what, maybe they're on the right side here, right? Not even close. Every single vote, all of those senators and congressmen, sided with Wall Street and tried to make the bill worse and weaker and weaker and then it's the same old Republican trick I've told you about a million times they come back out afterwards and go oh you see that it's too weak it's in favor of Wall Street that's because you made it that way but all discredit goes to the Democrats and Obama who play that game why you don't have to listen to these guys how many of these did you get George Lemieux's vote did you get John Boehner's vote did you get John Thune's vote? Oh, you didn't get any of their votes. Oh, that's interesting. Now, they did get three Republican votes, to be fair, uh, okay, in financial reform. Uh, but at least they should say, hey, you know what? I got those three Republican votes because I made the bill weaker. So if it doesn't work, it's on those three guys, or women in, in that case, uh, as guys and girls, uh, who made the bill weaker. So don't let them get away with this crap, this nonsense. All right. Now, that's the substantive points that Republicans have. Now... Glenn Beck uh, is going to go on with Bill O'Reilly, and he's going to tell us that he's got some uh, criticism of the Obama folks. I hope he's being tongue-in-cheek here. I think he mostly is, but I'm not entirely sure. 
Okay, if, I, so this is why we get so frustrated with Fox News. There are things to criticize the Obama administration about. This is not one of them. Let's watch. Yeah, the most Marie Antoinette I have ever seen of anything with Michelle Obama. Did you see the dress she was wearing while she went down and toured the oil spill? Did you see it? I did not. This is good stuff. Okay. It, she's, she looks like, who pulls this dress out of the closet and says, you know what, I think I'm going to go tour the oil. Because I can relate. It's a designer dress, all white, that has black so swatches So you, you don't think it. she was appropriately dressed for the oil spill? I think... This is an outrage. This is like it's an outrage. Oh, it's absolutely Her dress was an outrage. It's an outrage. Look at the dress. You guys, this is where I, I love you. This is what, Laura Ingram came on here last night and said that Michelle Obama's Whoa. garden, garden, is a left wing plot. Now you're saying Michelle Obama's dress right. is an outrage. Of course you do. Might be of right course, that. the no, garden no. is a left wing plot. No, the no, dress is an outrage. You, you, if you count how many things in that garden are red. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's all tomatoes. Can I not have a carrot? <laughs> Come on. All right, Glenn Beck. All right, look, I, I know he's kidding about the garden. Okay, I, Laura Ingram, I'm not sure, is kidding about the garden. Okay, uh, the red comment is obviously a joke. And the shirt, to be fair to him, it does look like oil splotches. <laughs> I wonder if Michelle thought, hey, maybe I, should, I shouldn't wear this shirt. I don't know if it ever occurred to her, et cetera. But he threw the designer thing in there, like, huh? wearing a designer shirt. So I don't even really know what his criticism is. Uh, JR, I gotta ask you, the outrage, is he kidding? Is he a little serious? I'm leaning towards kidding just because the demeanor was so laughing the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Unless okay. they're trying to just, unless that's a new method though. We'll throw the point out there, we'll laugh at the same time. Right. But it's still in your brain. Right, and then, you know, we'll mention, we'll throw in there, oh, it's a designer dress. Like, what was she supposed to go in like a hobo outfit? I, look. Are we being consistent here? In the eight years that Bush was president, I criticized him for thousands of things. Never Laura Bush's dresses. Okay. Now, anyway, but this is not a big deal. I hope he was kidding. But in a, if you're going to look for a plot, though, here's the real plot. The Laura Ingrams and the Glenn Becks of the world make Bill O'Reilly look reasonable. Okay? And he loves that. So he's like, oh, you crazy guys. Aren't I so moderate? And that's, that's a little problematic because he ain't no moderate. All right. So now, wait till you get a load of this. Now, look, we, this doesn't have to do with the financial reform. It doesn't have to do with criticism of the Obama administration. Uh, now we're just going to get into conservative and, and liberal fights, but they're fun ones. David Vitter has had some troubles in the past with women. Um, I'm not sure that I would go in a direction of talking about what women look like and don't look like, but uh, apparently he didn't follow my advice and talked about how Rachel Maddow looks. Very interesting. Uh, on a conservative uh, talk show in Louisiana, let's have the great misfortune of listening in. This morning uh, we've been talking about uh, the, uh, the capping of the oil well, whether or not you really believe that it's capped. By the way, you're laughing at me because on our Facebook because you told me to do it, mm -hmm. I posted uh, my first newscast, and I wonder if, like, if, if Senator Vitter is is ever going to post like uh, m maybe the video of his the first time he was on the floor. Yeah, that would be uh, cool. Of the Senate, you know, <laughs> if I have to show the way I looked the first time I was on TV, <laughs> Senator Vitter is joining us this morning. You should do that too. Oh, we should we should go further back than that. How about high school yearbook? Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Delisle marching band. Uh, oh yeah, know, that'd be cool. Well, you know, Rachel Maddow, they had that picture of her <laughs> of the horrible... looking, looking like a woman. Yeah, it was really bizarre. <laughs> so, <laughs> Senator, must have been, must have been a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Senator David Vitter joining uh, us this morning. Literally. Wow. <laughs> All right, there's two things I love about that. First, the laughter was awesome. This is Rush Radio 99.5 in New Orleans. Oh, ah, Senator Vitter! Oh, you're killing me! <laughs> he made a joke! He made a joke about Rachel Maddow. <laughs> She's <a> lesbian. <laughs> Okay. Senator, Senator, must have been okay. a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna really step into this, huh? Okay. So I, you now you're gonna make me follow up. Oh uh, well, you know what? <laughs> Last time she looked like a woman that I would pay for. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Last time she looked like a girl that I'd want to pay out some dough for. <laughs> 
You know, like the prostitutes I used to do. Like the DC madam and the girl back in New Orleans. You remember how I used to go to whores? Oh, are you? Oh, he left that part out. Huh, that interesting. <laughs> okay. Are you kidding me? All right, look, by the way, this is the picture they're referring to. And look, even if you privately thought, hey, you know, Rachel looks great there. And mind you, she's in high school. So bring it down, David Bitter. Bring it down. Okay. Okay. But I, if I'm the senator with the hooker problem, I wouldn't have made a comment along these lines. Okay. So anyway. And, and, and you know, I once debated on TV with some conservative, and I said to him, hey, look, if you're a gay American, why would you ever vote for the Republican Party, right? They're obviously not on your side. And he's like, why? Why do you say that? Huh? Look, you look at Rachel Maddow, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just short hair, lesbian, doesn't look like a real woman. I'll tell you, the last time she looked like a real woman was when she was a young girl in high school. Mm. <laughs> okay, not the direction I would have gone. All right, have at it, David Bitter. So, now we go from one clown to another. I understand this week there's been a little bit of an issue between the NAACP and the Tea Party folks. Uh, leading the brigade, if you will, for the Tea Party people is Mark Williams. He uh, is a spokesperson, apparently, for the Tea Party Express. Uh, they are one of the teams that play in the Tea Party Bowl of some sort. And, and so, uh, he's gotten into a little bit of uh, trouble, but first he's going to tell us that the NAACP is outrageous and that they are, uh, the Tea Parties cannot be racist. That's a fascinating theory. Let's go to clip number five. Do we Especially move to the people in his own group. By either the, side calling the, out extremism in their party, may it be in the NAACP or the Tea Party, is it a part of moving forward? Are you admonishing what some believe is a racist element and then the NAACP I'll, I'll admonish you, those who you say is, are race baiting? It's impossible, to be, it's impossible for there to be a racist element of the Tea Party. Oh, you don't okay. get it. The Tea Party mm -hmm. is about human rights. It's about okay. the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution is what mankind's about the signs foremost with the, human the president document. as an African with a bone is his nose. What is that? Is that Again, about the Constitution? Again, those signs were brought to the Tea Parties by Crash the Tea Party, oh, okay. which was a coalition of anti-Tea Party groups. Google Crash the Tea Party. All right, you Mark, will find I, it okay. all there. They well, we're organize. out of time, Mark. I hate to cut you off, but I do appreciate you coming on and us having Go what I Mark believe Talk. was a cordial Com, conversation. Find the okay, whole Mark, thing. bye bye. Thank buy you. Buy my book. Well, one. moving on. <laughs> buy my book. Buy my book. Okay. Uh, by the way, Crash Tea Party stuff was something that you will find on the web. I don't know if they ever actually went to an event that was never proven in any way, but they had nothing to do with the original Tea Party protests. Uh, the ones that had all those pictures were right from the get-go. So Mark Williams, as usual, is totally full of crap, right? And the incident where they yelled at the black congressman and they spit on one of the black congressmen, Backed up by other white congressmen, if you make that, makes it more credible for you. They said they also witnessed it, right? Uh, but no, no, it's not possible, because the Tea Party people cannot be racist. Uh, they were especially immunized by God. <laughs> they said they sprinkled a little, little non-racist dust on them, so it is not possible. I don't know why it's not possible, even though some evidence indicates that some of them are. I don't think all of them are by a long shot. And if you want to get upset at the whole group being smeared that way, I think that's a legitimate beef. But saying none of them can be racist is a little weird, especially coming from Mark Williams, because now let's go to some of his other appearances. This is Mark Williams on, uh, with Roland Martin. Let's check that out. I'm not going to uh, preface every sentence I say for the rest of my life. By the way, we're not racist. By the way, I don't beat my wife. We are what we are. And when these vile people show up, they find out that we're, we're not a happy home. But yeah, as I'm, long I'm as they keep turning on that. the TV and listening to people like you, Roland, saying that no, that's where I, they'll find a happy actually, home, they're going to keep showing Mark, up. You're not going to lie on CNN. I never said that. And I have said That's consistently. what you're saying right now no, no, this no, no. entire Mark, Mark, interview. Mark, 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 allow me to finish. I have said consistently, the Tea Party people have an absolute right to assemble, to protest. But what I have said, there's no right in that it. movement for racists. And what I've said is, you should come out and oh. say, you're not welcome here. And your Racists own have their own movement. It's called the gotcha. NAACP Oh, right that's now. nonsense. But they've done right. more. They bought no more. Bunch of old racism. fossils you looking to make okay, a buck off nice, skin Mark. color. That's nice, Mark. Not, but they've done more to combat racism than you have ever had. So right. You can rip them all you want to, but they have a long history of fighting for the rights of all Americans, not just African Americans. 
Okay, the NAACP, which brought uh, African Americans, help, certainly helped to bring African Americans civil rights when they didn't have. Remember the colored uh, water fountains, and now uh, you couldn't go into a restaurant, you couldn't go into a hotel. Do we not? The NAACP fought against that, but they're the racists. I mean, you just heard Mark Williams say it, right? But it's Tea Party people cannot be racist. And that there's just a bunch of uh, old people trying to cash in on race. Okay. All right, now you think that's bad? Oh, it's about to get much, much worse. Let's go to clip number four with Mark Williams. I don't recall the NAACP speaking out when George Bush was portrayed as Curious George or as the Joker. I don't recall the NAACP ever standing up and saying that we needed to, you know, civilize discourse when, when Republicans were in the White House. You're dealing with people who are professional race baiters who make a very good living off of this kind of thing. They make more money off of race than any slave trader ever. It's time groups like the NAACP went to the trash heap of history where they belong with all the other vile racist groups that, that emerged in our history. But the Tea Party people, they cannot understand why anyone would be concerned if some people uh, are racist within the group. He really doesn't get it. Look, if you want to have a, a, a beef with how the NAACP is conducting itself now, okay, that's, you know, that's a legitimate debate, that's a legitimate conversation in the country. To say the NAACP is racist when they help to bring about civil rights, and to say one of, the, one of the most racist groups out there and that they're race baiters, et cetera, they made more money than slave traders after they helped to liberate not just African Americans, but as Roland Martin said, they give all Americans more rights. You can't see how that might be offensive. You can't see how some black folks in the country might not take kindly to that, how that might seem like you're putting them off a little bit, that you might be you know, denigrating them as they think the NAACP represents them. That doesn't occur to you? No, but Tea Party people cannot be racist. They're so shocked and chagrined by the charges. Where the hell did you come up with that craziness from? Now, if you think all oh, that wasn't bad enough, then Mark Williams has the unbelievable idea of writing a letter called Dear Mr. Lincoln, presumably to Abraham Lincoln, he's very clever, from Ben Jealous, uh, who is, the, of course, the head of the NAACP. And here's what some of the letter. Uh, we coloreds have taken a vote and decided that we don't cotton to that whole emancipation thing. Freedom means having to work for real, think for ourselves, and take consequences along with the rewards. That's just far too much to ask of us colored people, and we demand that it stop. Now, he continues in the rest of the letter, again, pretending to be Ben Jealous, the head of the NAACP, speaking this way. Uh, bailouts are just big money welfare, and isn't that what colored, uh, all colors uh, strive for? What kind of racist would want to end big money welfare? What they need to do is start handing the bailout directly, bailouts directly to us coloreds. Can you get a sense of how Mark Williams views the NAACP, all black people, all coloreds? They just want bailouts, they want welfare, and he's putting it theoretically in the mouth of Ben Jealous. Of course, Ben Jealous thinks everything that this says is atrocious. Does he think this is a joke? Oh, it'll be really funny if I pretend that Ben Jealous is this like, you know, old, uh, in, not, I'm not calling him Uncle Tom. He calls, in fact, he signs it, Precious Ben Jealous, Tom's nephew. So he's an old Uncle Tom, okay, who speaks about masses and colors. You think masses? Wait, that's coming. Let me give you more quotes from the letter. What kind of massa would ever not want to control my life? As coloreds, we must have somebody care for us, otherwise we'd be on our own, have to think for ourselves and make decisions. Again, skipping to another part of the letter. Letter. That means we coloreds would have to compete for jobs like everybody else, and that's just not right. Skipping to another part of the letter. How will we coloreds ever get a widescreen TV in every room if non coloreds get to keep what they earn? Totally racist. The Tea Party expects coloreds to be productive members of society. Do you get the mindset here? I mean, he's just, if you don't get it, you're slow. He's telling you. He thinks, Ben Jealous and the NAACP thinks, oh, I want widescreen TVs, and I want to take it from the Tea Party people, from the white people. Us coloreds want us to get, want to get bailouts from all of you guys. And we don't think you really work for a living. But I don't know why you would think that any of us are ever racist. This is a Tea Party Express spokesperson. 
I don't know where we got that crazy. By the way, when this controversy started in the beginning of the week, I thought, you know what? I know some guys showed up at the events with crazy signs, but it's hard to control all those guys. And I know some guys yelled at the congressman, but I'm not sure it's right to label all the Tea Party people that way, right? And then here comes their spokesperson, at least for one of their groups. <laughs> that makes me think, oh, man, I was being way too generous. No, I mean, look at this guy, the leader of the group. If this isn't racist way of looking at not only the NAACP, but all blacks in the country, what the hell is? I mean, if the Tea Party people don't disavow Mark Williams, well, then you just said it. Okay, yeah, no, 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 we think black people are coming after our money. This is the hard part. From the beginning of the week, it was said, there are some racist elements that are infiltrating parts of the Tea Party, which is what was said by the NAACP at first. Um, and they should probably get rid of them so they can continue to protest probably with a good light on them so people can pay attention to them rather than them just having these parts that keep making them look bad. You should get rid of the trash that's or it's on the edges of your, of your organization. And then simply because people like this guy, Mark Williams, can't stand to either stop and think and go, oh, wait a second, maybe we should do something like that. Maybe we should take some advice. Maybe we should do something different to be more legitimate. Instead, you fire back. If you get any kind of criticism, you fire back huge. You blow up. So he's been blowing up for a week straight. So it gets worse and worse and worse because that's what's worked for Republicans. They blow up and they go crazy and they go crazy and they go crazy and they just say everything they want to say and they're going to get away with it. And they, that's how we win. That's how, that's how we got all these crazy people on our side already. So, but now he did nothing but prove a point that wasn't even being made about him. Now it does look like the whole, whole situation is like that. It looks like certainly one of their leaders is racist. And by the way, I mean, in case I'm not being clear enough, Mark Williams is a total and utter racist. I mean, if all those appearances didn't do it, and I thought he was being insensitive by not understanding the history of the NAACP, et cetera, this letter is game, set, and match, man. I mean, this is what he thinks of black people, that they just want to take white people's money. He's a piece of crap. That's what he is. I mean, uh, all right, if I keep going, I'm going to keep saying worse and worse things. All right, we've got to take a break here. Come back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, got a couple more stories for you. Anna, by the way, is not in today. And um, we're going to squish the three hour show into two hours. We've got some great interviews coming up for you uh, in the next hour, including someone who's going to defend Mark Williams and is going to tell us that we misunderstand the Tea Party movement altogether and that they're in no way, shape, or form racist. That's going to be a good conversation. I just can't see how that wouldn't be good. So that's coming up in the next hour. Now, in this hour, uh, we also have some. Uh, issues going on uh, throughout the country. Um, let's start in Texas. Uh, Paris, Texas said, has had its share of problems uh, recently. Uh, a year ago, they had some uh, racial flare ups where there were some skinheads and Black Panthers, and there was a face off, and people were talking about that. Unfortunately, um, this latest video is not going to help the situation. Uh, we've got a case of police brutality. Let's check it out first. This dash cam video was shot on November the 10th and shows a Paris police cruiser coming to aid a fellow officer in making an arrest. Police Chief Bob Hunley says what happens next is not standard police procedure. This is just one of those situations that I think that the, uh, the emotions and frustration uh, got a little bit out of, out of line. The man being thrown on the hood of the car is 18-year-old Cornelius Gill. I guess he got aggravated or anything with me, but he just slammed me on top of the car and just yanking on me. Gill was taken to the hospital but wasn't seriously injured before he was taken to jail for disorderly conduct. It really hurt it. I, I couldn't breathe or anything. I, I just couldn't believe he'd do somebody like this. The officer involved was suspended for two days without pay after an internal investigation, and Chief Hunley says that his department takes allegations of police abuse very seriously. We're going to look at each and every complaint that comes up to see if there's anything there or not. And unfortunately, in this case, and it was my, my call, my, my opinion, that uh, this was over what we should have been doing, and that's the reason why we responded the way we did. That response has left Cornelius Gill with mixed emotions. I'm glad that something happened to him, but I, I feel like there's, you know, there needs to be more happens to him for this. All right. Well, look, the, notice the, the main uh, 
cop who's in charge says that he's not really defending the guy. And in fact, he suspended him only for two days without pay. You know, we've seen over the years much worse police brutality, uh, honestly. And they rough up a lot, a lot of guys as they're taking them to the ground. But notice in this case, the kid's already handcuffed, right, before he gets slammed onto the car. So should they have taken some action against the cop without knowing the context behind it, etc.? It looks like yes. Is it enough? I, I'm going to leave that for you to decide. Uh, you know, I'm glad that the other cop that came in didn't aggravate the situation because there's a couple of guys who are mad in the background. That got handled uh, pretty decently. And then I, I like uh, what Cornelius said. He said, I can't believe he'd do somebody like that. <laughs> that was funny. Um, all right, uh, JR, what do you think? Two days? What, that's what he got? He I got think two I missed, days suspension I missing, without pay. Uh, come on, dude. But, okay. More, you think? Yeah, this is what I've never understood. When it comes from school to things like this, get rid of a guy for two days. I mean, come on, dude. For t- if you suspend somebody Would for. Would you fire him? Me. I mean, really? there's, once you cross a line, I don't care if it, because the kid wasn't bleeding from the mouth and lost some teeth. I mean, why do you have to see blood before it's considered abuse? Abuse, it's a threshold, and it's all the same in there, you know, and he crossed it already. He was at the bottom of it, if you're going to talk about level of injury, but he's already in, in abuse. So now what can he do next time? You know, the point is to prevent it from happening again. Yeah, and two know, days, the spinners are going to keep him from doing it, I don't think. Okay. You know what? Earlier I said uh, I let the audience decide. I changed my mind. I'm decided. You should have gotten two weeks, uh, no pay. Okay. Oh, well, you know what? If you say a month, no pay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll take it up on appeal. Okay. It make it hurt so that he knows after you've handcuffed, what's well, a pretty small kid actually. That you don't slam him to the ground like that. On the other hand, chairman, how many stories have we done where they're tasing and tasing and tasing and the guy's on the ground already, etc. You know, compared to those. And, of course, we don't know the context of why he did that, not that anything justifies it because you've already got him handcuffed, you've already detained him, et cetera. Having said that, I don't, I don't think I'd have fired the guy based on what we've seen here, but I'd make it hurt, you know, two weeks, a month, whatever it takes to make sure that he doesn't do it again and nobody else in that area does it again. Now, given the, the racial problems that already existed in Paris, Texas, which is what I started with, you know what? Apparently, we already had the appeal a month uh, with no pay. Okay, that'll hurt, and that'll send the message: Hey, we got to get this thing under control. We can't be doing this. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm already out of time. What am I going to do? I didn't even get to the teacher anointing people with holy oil. Maybe a little later in the program. Let's see how it shakes out. Okay, Young Turk. <laughs>